Wait, is this just gate? Chapter 97 Written by Pepper Antique The door to the cellar opened so violently that Camille thought it had been ripped off its hinges. Everyone in the room jumped, or flinched, or cried out in fear. They all had the same thought in their heads. That this was it, the elemental had finally come for them. He wrapped his arms around his family, hoping to buy them time, or at least die while holding them. Then the gigantic warrior from earlier came rushing in, with a large werewolf behind her. In the woman's arms was the body of someone small, wrapped in a water and mud-soaked blanket. Please! The wolf yelled out. Is anyone here a healer? The warrior jogged over to one of the tables that Camille had placed some of the family's clothes, on and brushed them all off before placing the bundled person on top of it. Boy! He yelled as he got up to confront them. What are you doing? She's hurt very badly. The woman said as she glared at Camille, daring him to say anything. We need a healer. The wolf repeated. The woman, Camille could see now that it was a small woman in the blanket, moaned in pain as the blanket was unraveled a bit. The flesh Camille saw underneath was red and black with scorch marks. There didn't seem to be an inch of the young girl that was untouched by the fire. You can't keep bringing people here. Kamir said, not knowing what else he could say. We're already full up. That's not important. The warrior said. Besides, we're not bringing anyone else. The fight's over. I'm a healer. Said a young boy. Kamir looked and saw Tamla, the young healer's apprentice from town, approaching. You're an apprentice. Kamir countered. I am. He replied. It's good enough. The wolf assured him. Please. She's hurt very badly. She said as she motioned for the young man to come over. Tamla did and began inspecting the burned woman. We can't be having more people here. Kamir said. But they ignored him. How'd she get burned? Tamla asked as his hands began to glow a dull amber. Was it the elemental? Yes. The warrior woman answered. She was fighting it. It got her during her last attack. That was her? Tamla asked incredulously. Had she managed to shield herself? Those burns won't heal if she wasn't shielded. She was. The warrior replied. But only barely, and it didn't last. That's not good. Tamla said, more to himself than to them. I'll do what I can. What can we do to help? The wolf asked. Mr. Kamir, we need some water from your well. Tamla said, less a request and more an order. Kamir began moving before he came to his senses. No. He said turning around to face them again. No, you need to get out of here. We can't be having all these people here. It's going to hear us. He said angrily. Suddenly the werewolf was standing directly in front of him. She towered over his dwarven frame, easily three feet taller than he was. It was only now, as she stood glaring at him with her teeth bared, that he realized that her armor had the marks of a captain of the guard. He quailed. She can't move. The wolf captain said. She only got hurt this bad because she was trying to save this village. She. Needs. Healing. She took a step forward, backing Kamir into one of his shelves. And as a captain of the king's royal guard, I am duty-bound to protect his archmage, and kill anyone who attempts to stop me from doing so. She said, her voice rumbling deeply, as if growling the words out. He could see the anger and, he thought, fear in her eyes. Then a hand appeared on the wolf's shoulder and pulled gently. Later Kel. The large warrior said calmly from behind her. Let's tend to Velyri. Get. Water. The wolf said before turning around. Kamir gulped. Then he ran out of the cellar to fetch water from the well pump outside. James was sweating as he jogged from cover to cover. The elemental was fighting again, the young mage and the arbalestia harassing it at every chance. But it wasn't quite as big as before. 
he thought that might have been a lingering effect of Vilayri's attack, or maybe because the area around it was positively soaked. But he wasn't sure, and he wasn't exactly capable of asking anyone. The mud was making it hard to move. The fact that it had been baked dried before Vilayri's attack, and then soaked and mixed with ash had made it into a gooey, sticky slurry of dark brown that sucked at his boots and slowed him down. It made him glad that he'd worn his army boots today. Not too many occasions where that was the case. On the upside of all the muck was the fact that the heat from the elemental was causing the water and mud on the ground around it to evaporate very quickly. As a result, the current fighting was occurring in a cloud of rapidly growing steam. The elemental was having a hard time seeing its two assailants, and the two of them were more freely able to move. Regardless, he had a plan. Or at least he hoped he had a plan. He'd find out when it either worked, or he got turned into Kentucky Fried Choi. He ran roughly 150 yards away from the fight, out into what looked like it had once been a farming field. It was burned bare now, the elemental having passed through it at some point prior to now. But James was fairly certain that the field had once been full of wheat, or at least something wheat-like. It was a large, open, relatively flat space that probably had nice soft soil. It also wasn't near any of the buildings, the closest of them being what looked like a farmhouse about 200 yards away. Or at least it might have been a farmhouse before the elemental had gotten to it. James stopped in the middle of the ashy field and began focusing his energy into his arms. He felt the familiar surge of power that came with casting spells and he began forming the spell in his mind, his fingers flying through the motions v had taught him. For a split second, he wondered if she was going to be all right. Then he felt the energy slip a bit, and he focused again. He couldn't see it, he'd closed his eyes to concentrate, but around him the light was warping and distorting. He felt his heart rate spike for a moment, he sagged a bit. Nope. He thought. Focus. Don't draw from yourself. You're not ready for that. Draw it from everything else. His heart rate settled again and he stood up a bit straighter. The air around him began to blow, like it had when he was casting wind magic. But that wasn't the plan, he was just drawing energy from the wind itself. The warping effect that was occurring, though he still couldn't see it, was because he was drawing energy from the light too. He could feel all of it flowing through him and into his hands. I wonder if this is what the old monks from Earth were talking about? The whole, becoming one with everything thing. He wondered. He kept building up the energy. It felt amazing. But after a few minutes his hands were getting hot. V. Lyrie had warned him of that. Until he got better at energy manipulation, and conditioned himself to handle more, he wouldn't be able to go much further than this. Still. He thought. I think this'll make a good start. James opened his eyes, and extended his arms outward, holding them together like countless anime power attacks he'd seen. Then he released the spell. There was a moment of lag before he saw anything occur. It was brief, maybe a heartbeat or two. Then the ground in front of his hands began to bubble, as though someone was boiling it somehow. He felt the ground beneath his feet vibrating, as if there was an earthquake, or maybe a large train rumbling past. Then the ground in front of him seemed almost to run away from him. He had a vague sense of being in one of those dreams where you're running towards a door but the door keeps getting further and further away. That was how the space in front of him looked. He was standing still but it just retreated and fast. Where before there had been solid ground, now there was a massive hole. It wasn't as deep as he wanted. Or as wide as he'd wanted. And it was angled away from him, creating a bit of a slope. But it was a start. That's what? He asked no one in particular. Fifteen feet? Maybe twenty. He looked at the sides and did some estimates. And about ten wide. He nodded. All right. He walked around the edge of the hole, mentally aiming at a different part of the ground and at a different angle. Round two. He said before closing his eyes and beginning to focus again. The air and light around him began to bend again. Gresha was doing everything he could to keep fighting. 
but he'd already been fighting for hours before the archmage had crashed to the ground. An armor didn't get lighter the longer you wore it. Not even enchanted drake mail like his. And he was slowly but surely running out of the mentium bolts that were in his bottomless bag. Sarah was going to kill him when she found out. Assuming he lived that long. The bolts had cost a fortune to source materials for, and she'd spent months slowly but surely enchanting them with the magics necessary for them to adapt to his needs. Each one would be worth at least twenty gold pieces, if not more. Yes. Sarah would be quite cross when she found out. He brushed the thoughts from his mind as he landed on the scrap of a building that his bodypult carried him to. The heavy-weighted, heavily enchanted, projectile returning to his hand rapidly as he reeled in the chain attached to it and then slotted it back into his quad ballist's lowest launcher. He quickly aimed the weapon at the spot the elemental was at, and then pulled back as he saw the mage running through the mist and launching spell attacks at the massive creature. He didn't want to hit the young woman. He wouldn't, he knew his aim was better than that, but he played it safe. Plus he was low on ammo. Where's that young weird-looking man? He wondered. I thought he was joining us. He took a moment to look around. Then he heard the crackling roar of the elemental and realized that he needed to help the mage. He raised the quad ballist to his shoulder, focusing his magical energy into the weapon. The energy channeled through the arcane runes and inks that were on the weapon's grips and flowed into the bolts he had slotted. He focused it into frost magic, much like the mage would for her spell attack, and saw the heads of the bolts glow a soft blue. He aimed for the monster's face, if the writhing mass of flames could be called its face, and pressed two of the triggers, he paused for a split second adjusting his aim ever so slightly as he did, then depressed the third trigger. The three bolts flew towards the elemental as it swung its left arm out to sweep at the retreating mage. The first two bolts struck it in the head and exploded in clouds of powdery hoarfrost that clung to the elemental, if only for a moment. The elemental reeled as its body darkened around the projectiles. It roared and turned to face him, the frost already evaporating into more of the steam. Then the third bolt struck it in the forehead, causing more of the frost. Before the thing could recover and begin coming for him, he aimed the weapon up and away from him at a high angle and fired. The body bolt went flying through the air, and a split second later he was being pulled by the harness it was attached to as the projectile's enchantments launched it forward and gave it more weight. As he was flying he looked around. It took a moment, the thick steam around the fight making it harder to see, but he spotted the odd young man a few hundred yards away from where he was about to land. The air around him was distorting and warping with magical energy flow. What the hells is he doing? He thought. Then he saw the young man jump into a hole that he hadn't noticed before. Oh. He thought. That's his plan. He paused and thought for a moment. That might work. All right. James thought, sweat beading on his forehead from both the heat and the magical exertion of what he was doing. Four holes down. I think that might be wide enough. Now the not-so-fun part. He stepped to the edge of the hole on one of the sloped edges. It was a bit more funnel-shaped than what he wanted, but it was nearly fifty feet wide now, his last few casts being focused on width more than depth, and at its deepest it was nearly twenty feet down. Before he could second-guess himself he began sliding down the, surprisingly hard-packed, side of the funnel. Oh I hope I can get back up that when I'm done. He said to himself. He began casting again, the air and light around him fluctuating again. Now we just have to go deeper. He said. He paused for a moment, the spell slipping ever so slightly. Then he chuckled. That's what she said. He said with a grin. Then he went back to focusing on the spell.